These islands were formed some 8,000 years ago by the last retreating ice age. The Indian people knew them as the Garden of the Great Spirit. More prosaic 17th century French explorers added them up and called them the Thousand Islands. Shared by two nations, the islands straddle the Canada-US border for 100 kilometers along the St. Lawrence, from Kingston to Brockville. On this stretch of the river, there is one town within reach of more islands than any other. Gananoque, the gateway to the Thousand Islands, has been a hub for island residents for the past century. For over 80 years, the clock tower has marked the passage of time for the people of Gananoque. It's a pleasant river town, about three hours drive east of Toronto. In the summer, the town's population of 5,000 more than triples as visitors drop in on their way to the Thousand Islands. Gananoque's first tourist was a European duke who arrived by boat in 1826. He found a village quite different from today's town. There were fewer than 30 houses. Streets were deep in mud and some of the residents exhibited primitive manners. The Duke was not impressed. Altogether an insignificant village, he declared. Could he return, the Duke would be surprised by the changes. John Nalen is a lifelong resident of Gananoque. He is also president of the local historical society. I've always had a liking for history as a stamp collector, as a young boy. Um, I like to learn about other countries and other areas. It's almost every, uh, every house you pass, there's some type of a story more or less to, associated with the, with the dwelling. John's interest in the town goes back to its origin. Joel Stone is credited with founding the, uh, the, the settlement of Gananoque, and he arrived here in the spring of 1792. Now, the American Revolution is what drove Joel Stone away from the United States. He was a traveling salesman, or what was known as a Yankee peddler, right. and he was very well-to-do. Uh, he made an exploratory trip up the St. Lawrence River and come upon the site where the Gananoque River here flows into the St. Lawrence and he realized that this is where he wanted his, uh, his place, uh, his piece of property in the uh, British North America. 
Joel Stone envisioned the water power of the river. Now, of course, we have two sets of falls, one to my back and one in the foreground here, um, that provided the power in the early years of the settlement. Well, between 1860 and 1870, or 55 to 65 in that area, the population of the town doubled, which was a significant happening, and it went from 800 to 1600. And of course, uh, the banks of the Gananoque River, from the upper falls here to the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, were completely lined by factories. And it was at that time that the uh, sobriquet was coined uh, the Birmingham of uh, Canada. Gananoque had become one of the key factory towns of eastern Ontario. Its metalworking plants produced a range of goods, from rivets and nails to buggy wheels and automobile springs. Metal products are still important, and with new industries like tourism, they ensure a vigorous community, one that John Nayland takes pride in. It's a friendly town, and it's a town where um, people will go out of their way to help one another in not only times of crisis, but in times of, of, of help of any, of any matter. Mm -hmm. I just love the town. I, I, I just uh, feel that uh, uh, being able to be raised here is, uh, you know, couldn't be any better. Around Gananoque, there's more than one way to deliver the mail. Every day during the summer, Bing Jackson sets out for the islands. Morning, Bing. Well, morning, Fred. Here's your mail. All right, uh, everything okay this morning? Oh, yeah. yeah. See you Tuesday. The first service was started over 80 years ago by a remarkable riverman, George Funnel. He ran the mailboat for 36 years and in all that time missed only three days. He was a familiar and welcome sight around the islands, delivering not only mail, but groceries and other necessities of the islanders. As the area became popular with tourists, many took the mail route trip, not only for its beautiful scenery, but also for the entertainment that George provided. He was a great storyteller, and he loved to pull the people's leg. He would announce to his passengers with all seriousness, if you look over the side of the boat, you'll see the boundary line between Canada and the United States. He was always amazed at how many people actually looked. George Funnel was a pioneer. His mail route trips really were the forerunner of today's various Thousand Islands boat tours. Summertime in Gananoque, and the living is easy. Legend has it that long before the Europeans came, the Indians called this the place of health. They traveled here after a long and hard winter in the forest, drawn by the restorative power of warm sun and fresh food. People, it would seem, are still coming for the same reasons.
Gadanoque and the Thousand Islands have been attracting tourists ever since the late 1800s, when new rail links allowed passengers to travel in comfort right to Dockside, where steamers took them off to various cottages and hotels. The car brought a whole new wave of tourists. Early automobile travel was an adventure, as discovered by a Mr. Arthur Lyman, who drove from Montreal to Gadanoque. It took him four days and 26 tires. It was fishing that attracted many to the islands, and it still does. Thousand Island boat tours are a favorite with visitors. Meanwhile, relax and enjoy yourself while we share with you some stories and legends of triumph, tragedy, romance, shipwreck, and even piracy that have added to the Thousand Islands international reputation. These sheltered coves have hidden many a character, and one of the most colorful was a lighthouse keeper who happened to be a retired pirate. Bill Johnson started out as a Kingston merchant, but in 1811, the British accused him of smuggling and confiscated his property. He vowed revenge and left for the United States. During the War of 1812, he became a spy and an active partisan for the Americans. From his hideout in the islands, he and his cohorts harassed British shipping. After the war, the self-styled Admiral Bill Johnson spent his remaining years tending a lighthouse. Mind you, there were those who thought old Bill was still up to a little smoking. The famous landmark in the islands is Bolt Castle. George Bolt was an American multimillionaire. He owned hotels like the Waldorf Astoria in New York. And he was a romantic. In 1900, he set out to build a castle. It was to be an expression of his everlasting love for his wife. No expense was spared. Two years after construction began, his wife died. A telegram was sent to stop work. Within hours, the castle was silent and empty, and George Bolt never again returned to the island. In 1937, a blind boy from Pennsylvania came to the Thousand Islands for the first time. His name was Robert Russell. Recollecting that experience, he wrote, My 13th summer still glows, for it was then that I met the St. Lawrence. I felt, for the first time, that big, soft wind, and I could hear the river slapping at the boulders along the shore. Wind and wave spoke to my blood of sighs and power. He vowed that someday he would return, and he did. Now Robert Russell is an author and a professor of English. He and his family have been summer residents here for over 30 years. The uh, Thousand Islands is the, uh, the perfect compromise uh, of opposites. And they have the magic of, of, of wilderness, and they have many of the amenities of civilization.
Maybe no man is an island, as, as Dunn said, but, but everybody I know wants to, wants to own one. Well, uh, I, think, I think it's the idea that, that an island is a piece of the earth that's small enough to be, to be graspable, to be imaginable, to, to be understood, to be owned, to be, to be, to be lord of. And, and, and its barriers, its, its limits are very clear, you know? You fall off the edge of the island, you're wet, you know? <laughs> the barrier is very clear. It's another element of the world. Water is different. Water is magical, ever in motion. Sounds wonderful. Feels wonderful. Uh, it's a different world. Here, uh, the, the earth, the island, uh, resists. It will not be subdued. It will not be orderly nized, uh, if that's a word. Um, it, it is simply itself. It is rugged. It is uh, uh, bumpy. It is, uh, uh, but it is lovely. Uh, all time she is lovely, as Shakespeare, I think, said of Cleopatra. Each day is different. The earth is, is, it changes all the time. Everything changes the way in reality things change. We're, we're in a fluid universe. Gananoque's heritage is important to its residents. It is evident in the care they take to restore and preserve some of the reminders of another time. One of the finest restorations in town is this former residence built in 1831 for John McDonald, one of Gananoque's leading businessmen. It is thought to be one of the best examples of neoclassical design still remaining in Ontario. Today, the home has become Gananoque's town hall. Preserving the past here isn't just for the grown-ups. The Thousand Island Railway serviced the town for 73 years. It was one of Canada's shortest lines. And the only railway in the country where, for 25 cents, you could get a round-trip ticket to the cemetery. For the living, the cemetery was a popular picnic spot. Rick Bergson restores boats. His pride is in this 17-foot St. Lawrence skiff, built 60 years ago. Well, they use this, uh, well, as a means of livelihood, the, as a means of transportation, getting from one island to the other, the, before the days of motor. Um, there are versions of this slightly larger, which are uh, equipped with sails. You can sail these boats. They're quite unique. They have no rudder. They were sailed by shifting the weight from bow to stern to, to come about. Uh, generally has a 19 or a 20 or 21 foot boat because of the swift flowing river you couldn't leave a boat tied up or, or to the shore uh, bang against the rocks you wanted to get it right out of the water so it had to be manhandleable by probably by two people uh, yet it had to be large enough to to uh, um, face the waters that we have here which from time to time go quite rough um, then that becomes a design problem you can't get all the heavy timbers the normal longitudinal stringers that you'd put in a boat for rigidity in this particular case, uh, that is achieved by the lap straight construction where the, the, the thin laps are, are form the stringers, where they're joined together. This is, um, dates back to the Vikings as the old, uh, in actual fact. The very sharply pointed bow and stern uh, and the uh, uh, rounded bottom, uh, this provides uh, good trackability so that if you're rowing across a current or diagonal to a current, you can maintain your track. Quite, quite easily, it tracked beautifully this boat. 
There's nobody building these um, today for sale. To restore a, a boat like this uh, from the condition it was when we received it, you're looking at an expenditure close on $4,000. Um, and you have to have a, a love of boats to want to spend that amount of money on a simple little rowboat. This small part of the world has touched the lives of many people. We have met only a few. The young blind boy who felt the power of the St. Lawrence and came back. The millionaire romantic who built a castle. The letter carrier and local historian who cares about the past. In their own way, they, like the first Indian inhabitants, have been enchanted by this the garden of the great spirit.